Where are we? There we are. Good morning. Hope everybody in America and Canada is staying warm. It's 21 degrees here. Not so bad. Um, got a lot to talk about, so I guess I'll get started. Got three films, uh, two opening here today and one in America, which I think I should talk about because it's a good film and it's coming your way if you live. It's coming this way too eventually, although nobody seems to know when, but it will. So let's talk about the two films that are opening today in Hong Kong, and they couldn't be more different. <laughs> the first one is uh, Mary Poppins Returns, and the second one is Suspiria. Couldn't be more different, but I like them both. Anyhow, uh, let's talk. Mary Poppins Returns. As you, as everybody knows, I think by now, it is uh, the sequel to the beloved 54-year-old Disney classic Mary Poppins. I was six years old when it came out. Now you know how old I am. No, I couldn't have been six years old. Yeah, I guess I was six years old. Wow. Oh. And, um, yeah, but apparently in this film, although it takes place, um, it's, it's, the two films are 54 years apart, the action is only 25 years apart. So it's now 1935. If you didn't know, the first Mary Poppins was set in 1910. So this one's 1935, and the world is in the midst of the Great Depression, if you don't know your history. And Michael Banks and his sister um, Jane have grown up. Michael, played by Ben Wishaw, who people know from the Paddington films, and he's in uh, the James Bond series, and he was in The Danish Girl and Hologram for the King. He's living in the family home on London's Cherry Tree Lane with his three children, John, Annabelle, and Georgie, and their ever-faithful maid, or cook, uh, Ellen, played by the... Wonderful Julie Walters. She's in everything British, you know, and she's a wonderful actress. Julie Walters, um, who people would know from the Mamma Mia films and the Paddington films and Brooklyn and One Chance and, oh my God, uh, what was her name? Valentine? Uh, what was that film years ago? But she's been around and she's wonderful. You know, there was an Ellen, if you remember, there was an Ellen in the original film as well. Um, I can't remember the actress's name, but she passed away quite a few years ago. Even if she was still alive, she'd be really old. So obviously they had to recast uh, with Ellen, with uh, Julie Walters, younger, a younger Ellen. Although, you know, you could argue maybe it's two Ellens, you know. It doesn't have to be the same Ellen. Now, um, the times are really hard on Michael because we find out that uh, he's been a, widow, a widower for a year. His wife passed away. We don't know why, but she's passed away. And um, he's also a failed artist. So to make ends meet, he's gotten a job at the uh, fiduciary Fidelity Fiduciary Bank, which is the same bank that his father worked at, and he's got a job, Michael's got a job as a teller, just to, you know, tie things together. Meanwhile, Jane, his sister, and Jane's now played by Emily Mortimer. She's followed in her mother's footsteps. If you remember, her mother was a, a suffragette, not a very convincing one anyway, but a suffragette nevertheless. And uh, so Emily, or Jane, is a labor organizer. And... Um, you know, I think also, by the way, it's an under, it was an underwritten character as well, which was a little bit sad. Anyhow, um, Jack of All Trades, Bert, played by Dick Van Dyke in the original. He's long since retired from the chin chimney sweeping business, business, and he's been replaced by his apprentice named Jack, played by Lin-Manuel Miranda. Everybody knows him or would know, would know him or should know him from uh, Broadway, the Broadway play Hamilton, which he wrote and starred in. And um, he is a lamplighter, and or which they call a leery. I've never heard that word before. I don't know if it's a real word or if they made it up for this film. But lamplighters are called learies. Don't even know what it means. So now as the film opens, trouble comes knocking on the bank's front door when two of fiduciary, fidelity, fidu, fidelity fiduciary Banks lawyers serve Michael with notice that his home is going to be repossessed by the end of the week unless he pays back in full a loan that he's basically defaulted on or he's defaulting on. Um, so he's going to pay it back. So what are the banks is to do? Well, for young Georgie, who's about six, I'd say, his solution is to take Michael's old kite outside for a spin. But when a gust of wind from the east threatens to carry it up to the highest heights, uh, both the relic and the Bankses are saved in the nick of time by a woman carrying a carpet bag and an umbrella. And you know who that is. 
Mary Poppins. Uh, so that's all I'll say about the film. Now, there's a lot that I really liked about this film, and there's a few things that I wasn't so liking. I don't want to say I didn't like it, but uh, not as good as the original. So I'll talk with what I like. For, to start with, Emily Blunt as Mary Poppins. She's a delight. I mean, she was really fantastic. That was, you know, that was like an, it's an impossible role to, to win at because everybody's going to compare you to, Mary, to Julie Andrews. So impossible. She did a great job. You know? <laughs> and she's got a beautiful voice. Who knew? Clearly her husband knew. John Krasinski knew. I didn't know. Beautiful voice. Um, I don't recall Mary, this, Julie Andrews, Mary Poppins, being as exasperated with Mr. Banks as this Mary Poppins is with Michael Banks, though it's very interesting, you know, she's, uh, yeah, she's uh, clearly like, I don't want to say fed up, but she's, uh, you know, exasperated is a good word, exasperated, but anyhow, it was interesting, maybe, you know, maybe, uh, maybe it's closer to the way the books are, I don't know. But she was she was wonderful. Also good was Lin Lin Manuel Miranda. Look, he's a wonderful performer. He's he's incredibly talented, singing, dancing, incredibly talented. But the problem I had with with his performance here, it was good. But the problem I had with it is that he he's so used to being on the stage that he forgot. He maybe he doesn't remember doesn't know how to be in a movie. He was he was. Over, he was overdoing it. He was playing to the seats at the back of the theater, which in on the stage you got too. You got to play to the people at the back of the theater, so you, everything's got to be larger than life. But when the camera is like this, you don't have to be larger than life because people can see you in all your glory. You know, it's the people in the, in the stage who are sitting, you know, in the theater who are sitting in the back can't see you so clearly that you've got to do big actions. So I thought. You know, this hyper-exaggerated facial expressions, it didn't work for the movie. But he he did a good job. So, okay. You know, not bad. His Cockney accent, yeah, it was okay. Better than Dick Van Dyke's. <laughs> but, you know, I think my cat would do a better... I don't have a cat. But if I had a cat, the cat would do a better Cockney accent than Dick Van Dyke did. Speaking of Dick Van Dyke, 93 years old now... And he's uh, he, he's in this film too. He's credited as Navcade, which is an anagram of of his name, which is the same as it was in the film. He plays Mr. Dawes Jr., the head of the the bank. And in the '64 film, in addition to playing Bert, he also played Mr. Dawes Senior. So now he's playing the son. Amazing. Ninety three years old. He does a little dance jig. And I was, I was absolutely amazed at 93. My father's 93 as well. I don't know, look, my father moves, but I don't think he moves like that. So I was, that was wonderful. Also, 93-year-old, or maybe she was 92, I don't know. Uh, she's around the same age. Angela Lansbury, people would know her from TV's Murder, She Wrote. She's also in this film. She plays the balloon lady. And um, this was probably, you know, I understand that Julie Andrews was offered a cameo and she turned it down because she said, look, this is Emily's movie. I don't want to overshadow Emily. I have a feeling this was the role that she was offered. But um, Angela Lansbury um, took on this role and she plays this balloon lady. And it's a role that's re very reminiscent of, of the bird woman in the, in the first film. So instead of singing the birds, which is a, a song that Julie Andrews sang um, in the original, Angela Lansbury sings Nowhere to Go But Up, which is, um, you know, it's a very similar, it's a very similar um, song. And it includes, it even includes references to Let's Go Fly a Kite and A Spoonful of Sugar. And, you know, to me, as I, I was watching this film, I was trying to watch it as a six-year-old, you know, to be fair. And even the distributor, I, I asked the distributor, am I going to like it? And she said, pretend you're a kid. So I was really trying to watch it as a six-year-old. There, there was a little kid sitting a couple seats away from me. He looked very bored. <laughs> But, you know, what are you going to do? Um, you know, I, I, here's where, here are the, the problems I have with this film. The story parallels too closely to the original. Look, I get it. You got, you, you've got to be, if, you, if you're going to stray too far, people are going to be upset about it. This one was too close. So, you know, I get, it's, it's, a, it's a fine line. You know, you want, to, you want to pay homage to the original. You want to have something that's familiar, you know, 
but you want to be, you know, you want to be a little different. This wasn't different enough. And that, to me, that was a little sad. Um, you know, this film has got a, a character, Cousin Topsy, played by Meryl Streep. You know, a lot of makeup. And um, she was pretty good, actually. She was very similar to, in the first film, there was Uncle Albert, the guy who was laughing and couldn't get off the ceiling. She's got a song called Turning Turtle. So she's up on the ceiling. You know, all the, all, all the kids are up on the ceiling. You know, and the, the whole world is turned upside down. So, again, it's a very similar song to I Love to Laugh, which was in the first film. So there was like, you know, you had all these little winks and nods that this film gives to the original. Very nice, you know, I thought it was good, but it just seems like it's like too close. And it, it was like an inferior knockoff rather than being an exciting new chapter in the adventures of the Bankses. So, you know, I don't know. The other problem I had with, with this film is the songs, they're very nice, but they're not very memorable. I saw the film last week. I don't remember any of the songs, you know, and yet I can sing Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, you know, 54 years later, although I did have the album. So <laughs> maybe that cheats. Uh, look, we'll know in 54, well, I won't know, I'll be dead, but, you know, other people will know in 54 years whether these songs are as, as lasting as those songs were. I don't think they are. I don't think these were as good songs you know like you had this jack and the other learys they had this big production number trip a little light fantastic it wasn't anywhere near as good as step in time which was the big production number in the original film mary's uh the place where lost things go beautiful song i think that's, that's the one that's nominated for an oscar beautiful song but it's it's not as good as supercalifragilisticexpialidocious so you know a little disappointing there um now, apparently, a sequel, this sequel, not a sequel, not this sequel, a sequel had been planned right after, you know, from, right from 1964, um, after the first film came, came out, but the book's author, P.L. Travers, was very much against doing another film if it was going to be like the first one. If you've seen the film Saving Mr. Banks, you know she was not a fan of the first film at all, and apparently she put a lot of conditions on the second, if there was going to be a second film, she put a lot of conditions down, and they just said, uh, forget it, you know, let, let's wait till she kicks off, so they did, <laughs> you know, I don't know when she died, but they've dealt with her, with her estate on this one, and they approved this one, and they're probably happy they did, because the film has made over 300 million dollars, had a production budget of 130 million, so it's almost tripled, and in Hollywood, that only means one thing, there's going to be another sequel, <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, I don't know if there's going to be another sequel. I assume there's going to be another sequel because it made so much money. Emily Blunt has also said she's up for it if they do make it. Um, so, you know what, even though I think this was this was a good film, not a great film, had some problems, it doesn't matter because it's, going to, it's making tons of money for Disney and they're going to have another sequel. And I'm not six years old. So, you know, it's perfect in every way. So that's all I can say. I, you know what, go see it, try not to compare it to the first one, try to enjoy it for what it is, and then afterwards, then you can compare it to the first one, and you're going to see I'm right. Songs aren't as good, story's too close to the original. So, that's Mary Poppins Return. Returns. Now, in a completely different vein, we have Suspiria. The remake, well, uh, is, it, is it a remake? It's a reboot, not really a remake, it's a reboot or an homage to Italian director Dario Argento, that's uh, Asia's daddy, um, you know, Asia Argento, who's gotten into trouble the past few months for her mouth and a few other things, um, he did a so-called classic horror film, well, it's now classic, I don't know why, from 1977 called Suspiria, which his wife wrote, or the mother of Asia, or Asia's mother, I don't know if that they were married. Um, his, let's just say his partner. I don't know that they were married. Um, now, this is the new one by Luca, Luca Guadagnino, who did Call Me By Your Name. Great film. Great film. Um, and this is his take on that film. This film premiered last September, so a few months ago, and at the Venice International Film Festival. It received an eight-minute standing ovation, but people are saying, well, that's because Luca's Italian, and they give standing ovations to every film. <laughs> but from what I also heard, people walked out, and definitely critics of this film are not as enthusiastic about it as audiences are. Audiences aren't really embracing this film either. 
too great. You know, to some extent, you know, they are they are liking it, but not warmly. They're not really warm to this film, but critics are, are definitely cold, 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 cold. And I'll talk about that in a second. So the the story is now. If you've seen the first one, it's okay. It's these are these are quite different films. I mean, the, the you know the the out, the broad outline, the broad strokes are the same. But if you remember the first film, it was a very um, sparsely written film. In other words, it's crap. <laughs> you know, and I'll talk. About, I'm getting ahead of myself here. But um, so so what Guadagnino and his his writers have done is they've they've added to the story. So it's quite it's quite more it's a lot more fleshed out, too fleshed out, in fact. Um, so the story it still takes place in Germany, but the original film was in uh, Freiburg, which is in the southwest corner of Germany. This is in West Berlin. Still takes place nineteen seventy seven. So I say West Berlin as opposed to East Berlin. The, the wall divided the city, separated families, and it was a time when the Bader Meinhof uh, group were in the news every day. These were um, the Red Army faction, um, you know, anarchists, and uh, what were they? Um, there's um, What's the word I'm trying to think of? Anyhow, look it up. Red Army Faction. Bader Meinhof Group. Bader Meinhof Group. Now, so this film really deals with all that. Unnecessarily, in my opinion, should have should have ended up on the cutting room floor. But anyhow, um, like the original, American Susie Banyan, this time played by Dakota Johnson, who we just saw in Bad Times at the El Royale, but people would know her from the Fifty Shades series, which I did not see. Um, she comes to the Marcos Tanz Company's Dance Academy in West Berlin to be a dancer. And unlike the original Susie, we come to learn quite a bit about her. More, We didn't learn anything about the original Susie. This Susie, we, know, we learned quite a bit. She grew up in a Mennonite household in Ohio, and uh, her mother was certain from an early age that Susie was different from the other children. Now, I read somewhere that there was a twin in 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 the this film. I don't remember there being a twin, but anyhow, unless I I don't know. So maybe she was a twin. Um, I don't remember. And we also learned that she's been a fan of legendary dancer Helena Marcos for ages, and she arrives at the school without any professional training, but she knows all the choreography for their big dance number. So she at her audition for the company head, Madame Blanc. Um, now, note this, Blanc means, means white um, in French, played by Tilda Swinton. She proves, Susie proves her worth, and she becomes Blanc's protege. And later, when her fellow dancer Olga disappears, Susie is elevated to lead the troupe, and she passes it with flying colors. Colors being the operative word here. Now, however, while the women are dancing upstairs, Olga is trapped in a fully mirrored room downstairs, directly under them, and every exacting motion that Susie's arms inflict and you know takes it inflicts serious dif disfigurement on Olga's body that's the best part of the film and I wish there was more of that that was really a fam fabulous scene so the academy it turns out is a front for a coven of witches run by the matrons which is the same as the original film all right so now having seen both movies I don't know, and I've seen Argento, you know, I saw Argento's film. I don't understand why people like it so much. It's crap. The acting is awful. There's no character development. The dialogue is stilted. The production values are poor. And, of course, fans are going to say, oh, but the soundtrack by Goblin. I'm sorry. It's overbaked. It's overplayed. And they'll say, wow, but he understood primary colors. You know, the okay, he turned on a red light, a red spotlight. Big F deal. <laughs> You know, I don't get it, but people love that film and they love him. I don't get it. I did not like that film. I prefer this film much more, although this film does have problems. To start with, it's bloated. It's 152 minutes versus 98 for the original. So Guadagnino's thrown in so much context here and, and um, you know, social, social context, uh, some abstractionism. Not necessary at all. I would have just gone cut, 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 cut. I'm not saying cut it down to 98 minutes. You know, 120 minutes would have been fine. But 152 minutes was insane. But this is an insane film anyway. So maybe it fit. 
Now, on the good side of this film, the dance choreography is excellent. There was no dancing in the, I don't even remember in the, in the Argento film, was there even any dancing? I don't think they showed any dancing in the other one. This one, they're, at least they're dancing. And as I said, the this, this scene with Susie and the ill-fated Olga was the best scene. The editing was amazing, superb, superb, superb. And the music by Radiohead's Tom York, uh, is evocative. It's much better than Goblins. Sorry, kids. Sorry, Argento fans. I'm not one of you. <laughs> you know. And the director's use of color or the lack thereof is masterful. You know, like he's got this very sort of um, uh, muted palette. You know, uh, Susie in the beginning, everything is gray except for Susie's hair, which is red. And obviously, red is the big is the big color as it was in the original film as well. You know, red is the important color here. Um, and and slowly, slowly, the you know, there is more red as the film progresses and you'll understand why unless you've seen the film. I, you know, even if you've seen the original, this one is sufficiently different enough that you can see this one too and not know where it's going. Um, so um, as much as I didn't like, as much as I liked this version, I was disappointed that it wasn't crazier. It needed to be more nightmarish. Um, with the, you know, really with the exception of that dance scene, it, it sort of was, you know, the ending is disturbing as well. So those are the two scenes. I'd say the dancing and the ending, those are the two really good parts of this film. The rest is like, yeah. Um, there's a couple things that are really crazy, like crazy, crazy, <laughs> you know, but unfortunately not disturbing crazy. So, you know what, I think had this film been less artistic, more bonkers, this would have been this would have been an amazing film. My friend James calls it his favorite film from last year. It didn't make my top 10, but I did enjoy it. So, I'd say, you know what, it's it's not a film for everybody. It's a very difficult film to watch because it is it is bonkers, but not bonkers enough. So, if you're up for the challenge, I say go for it, watch it. Um and, um, and you know what, if you haven't seen the Argento film, check it out, and you'll see, I'm right. I don't get it. Why do people like that film? Why do they like him? I don't get it. Sorry. <laughs> Last one I'm going to talk about. How am I doing here? Oh, I'm still talking too much. As a BBC film called They Shall Not Grow Old. It's not, come, it's not playing here in Hong Kong, but it is on the BBC, and it is being released starting today by Warner Brothers in the States. It's going to make its way around the world eventually. I contacted the Warner Brothers person here. I said, is it coming? He said he didn't know. He hasn't been told anything about it, whether it's coming here. I hope that the International Film Festival in April is going to pick it up and people can see it. It's really an amazing film. It was it was commissioned by the BBC to, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the end of the First World War, which was supposed to be the war that ended all, that would end all wars. Ha! It didn't. But what um, Peter Jackson, who's the, the, you know, the guy from Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, what he's done here is he's taken archival silent footage that was sitting, there was like 600 hours that he worked with, sitting in the Imperial War Museum in England, and he's taken old BBC recordings of uh, testimony that uh, yeah, that soldiers gave. Um, the testimony was probably given in the 50s or the 60s, I assume. I don't even know. Um, and what he's done is he's he's created this visual masterpiece that that's going to it's it's going to change the way we look at these these this historical film restoration and presentation. And so so what he's done here is like he took these old movies, this old footage, which was shot at 13 frames per second which today we typically shoot at 24 frames per second. I mean, we have had one film that was uh, 40, um, that um, uh, the Taiwanese, Taiwanese director did a couple years ago, which I didn't like. Um, but typically 24 frames per, se per second is the norm. So these were shot at 13. And, and, you know, if you've ever seen these old films, you know, when they're shot at 13 but presented at 24, everybody's walking fast. Now you know why. <laughs> So what he's done is he's he's a, he's brought it up to 24, but still kept the speed the same, which is fabulous. And he's um, 
He's colorized it. So for the first time, we see he's cleaned up all the noise, you know, the scratches and the noise and the waver and the whole thing, and he's colorized it. So the first time we see these people's faces really clearly, we see that they have rotten teeth, which is probably quite typical for, for back then because, you know, they didn't have fluoridated water, they didn't know about dental hygiene, and most of these kids were poor. So, you know, I always wanted, my grandparents had dentures at a very early age. I didn't know why, I, you know, I always sort of wondered why, but, you know, that's why. They didn't have dental hygiene back then. And um, what he did also, you know, these were silent films. There was, they did have talking films back then, but it was very much in its, it wasn't commercially available. The, the French Pathé had already invented it, but it really wasn't available. And so what he has done is he, where, where, you could see people talking. He employed lip readers and voice actors to give these people a voice. And otherwise, he's, he does voiceover testimony from over 100 soldiers who were there at the Western Front who could talk about what it was like. So, and so now you're seeing the war. For the very first time, you're seeing World War One in 35 millimeter color. I think some cinemas are even going to show it in 3D. And you're hearing it in Dolby Atmos. Uh, sound. So it's really, it's just, it's absolutely astounding. It's, it's fabulous. And I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope that if the Germans still have their war footage, I hope somebody there does the same thing. And we can compare the two because I think we're going to see that these soldiers and their soldiers are probably a lot more similar than they thought that they were at the time. So this was an amazing feat of, of an amazing technical feat from on the part of Peter Jackson. Fabulous presentation called They Shall Not Grow Old. So it's available right now on the BBC. Warner Brothers is rolling it out to the United States starting today, February the 1st. And we don't know whether it's coming to Hong Kong. But if you have a chance to see it wherever you are, definitely check it out because it's really an amazing film. They Shall Not Grow Old. That's it. I'm finished talking. I don't know if I'm here next week because it's Chinese New Year, so I might take the week off. We'll see. Bye.